What's up, Internet? SP here for the Marduk Report, and today I want to talk to you about backups. Specifically, are you doing like the 3 2 1 rule? You know, how's your backup situation? Do you even know what the 3 2 1 rule is? Because I know that maybe not everyone does. So, for those of you who don't know, let me run through it real quick. The 3 2 1 rule is basically states that for any really, really important, I can never lose this file ever, that you have three copies of it on two separate devices and one being off-site. That's basically it, right? So for me personally, I wasn't really following this rule. I was really more doing kind of like a two, two, one, one and a half-ish. Um, and I was doing backups, but I wanted someplace central to put all of my files. That's why today I'm gonna go over this lovely build. This is my 20 terabyte NAS that I built uh, a few months back. And it's cost me less than a thousand dollars. So I'm gonna show you guys today how to build something like this. So for this build, I had two real main requirements. One, that it'd be big enough for all of my files, all, everything, all my illustrations, all the raw video files for this channel, any kind of important documents I had, any important documents that my better half has, anything she wants to put on here. And the second requirement was that it looked really sleek. Right, so my original intention for this build was that it was going to be out on display, like up in uh, an open area where everyone could see it. So I didn't want something that was super ugly or super like very, what's, how should we say, non-significant other friendly, you know, like something that would pass the girlfriend test. So in this video, I want to go over just the parts that I chose and do the actual build. The next video, we're gonna talk about software, software choices, setting up the software, and then my final thoughts on the entire thing. So in this video, I'm just gonna go over the actual parts that I chose and do the build. The next video, we're gonna go over software choices, software setup, and then my final thoughts on the entire process. So I just wanna also state that the build sitting next to me, this one right here, is actually V2 of my NAS. So I've made an initial build and then I made some changes to it because there were things I just didn't really like. So at the end of this video, I'm actually gonna go over the parts that I changed and what I, what I added, what I took out after going through the initial build. As you can see, the build sitting here is ITX and I really wanted something small, something that wouldn't be too intrusive because again, like I said before, that this was gonna be out on display for everyone to see. Those plans got scrapped because of crap wiring in our rented apartment, but so in the storage closet, this is gonna go. So first up is the CPU, and I went with an AMD X4860K because I had one lying around from a previous build. It's not the greatest processor for this application, but it is relatively very inexpensive and more than enough power actually for a build like this even in my testing and even running this for days, weeks, uh, I'd never saw any of the CPU cores hit 50% load, let alone 100%, so more than enough. And you can get one now for, I think like 70 bucks on Amazon, so super, super cheap. For the motherboard, I went with a ASRock FM2 A78 Mini ITX motherboard. Again, it's FM2, Really, really inexpensive, and ASRock is one of the few companies that still makes a good amount of ATX, ITX, correction, motherboards for the FM2 platform. This is a, the A78 board. There's also an A88, which you can get on Amazon for about 80 bucks. The main difference is that the, the A88 has uh, onboard Wi-Fi, but you don't really need it. You're not going to need it at all, but both of these boards, the one I have and the A88, have six SATA ports, which are super important, and it's actually really hard to find motherboards with six SATA ports on them that are not from the Intel 100 series. For memory, I have 16 gigs of DDR HyperX Fury RAM from Kingston. I would have liked to use 32 gigs, but buying single DIMMs of 16 gigabyte DDR3 RAM would have added significantly to the cost of this NAS. I know it's not ECC RAM, which is really what you should have for any kind of servery NAS uh, project, but this is gonna have to do. I picked up my kit for about $65, but as DDR3 is getting phased out in favor of DDR4, 
finding really inexpensive DDR3 kits are going to be challenging from now on. The power supply is a Thermaltake Smart SE rated at 530 watts with 87% efficiency. Again, I had this from a previous build and it's way more than enough power. At peak, I don't expect the system to draw more than 200 watts. It's also modular so that I can pull out any unnecessary cables. You could get something like the Thermaltake Tough Power 550 on Amazon for about 80 bucks. The GPU is a Gigabyte HD 6770. Old builds are great, aren't they? If you use an APU or any other processor that has onboard graphics, you totally won't need a GPU at all. I only needed one because my good old Athlon had no onboard graphics, so I needed something just for the initial setup. The case here, if you clearly haven't been able to tell, is a bit Phoenix Phenom. It's one of the few ITX cases that supports six three and a half inch drives. The others that I know of are the Bit Phoenix Prodigy and the Fractal Design Node 304. Plus, this case has a capacity for a 230 millimeter fan on the front to blow air over all the drives. I could have bought either of the other two cases, but I've always wanted one of these. The Phenom costs about 85 bucks on Amazon. At the heart of this NAS, and any other NAS really, are the drives. I went with five Seagate 4TB desktop drives. These are the ST4000DM000 drives. There are two real reasons that I went with these drives instead of ones rated for a NAS. One was the Backblaze reliability reports from Q3 2015 up until Q1 2016, and two, the price. So I don't really take these as gospel, but the Backblaze reports do, do provide some really interesting numbers and are a good place to start narrowing down which drives you actually want to use for your NAS build or whatever or for whatever build you actually want to use them for. Uh, according to these reports, four terabyte drives in general are doing really well and have really low failure rates across the board, regardless of what the manufacturer says their intended use is. And if you couple that with the massive sample size of Seagate drives that Backblaze is using, which is as of Q1 2016 was something like 35,000 drives that they're using at once. And, you know, that's a pretty good reason to consider them. The other reason is the price. Here in Singapore, all drives are overpriced compared to the U.S., so that's just the FYI. And sometimes the price, when converted, can be as much as 40% higher, which is crazy to even think about it. But at the time when I actually built this and when I was buying the drives, that was the case for WD Red drives at this capacity. So I started looking around, and started, that's why I considered these Seagate drives. The drives ended up costing me about $130 per drive once you convert the, do the currency conversion, which is still a bit much compared to the $109 they are right now on Amazon, but you know, still not bad. Lastly, I picked up a flash drive, um, namely this 32 gig Toshiba drive. I totally don't need a drive this big for the operating system, but it was on sale. So I was like, okay, sure, let's get it. NAS for free only requires eight gigs of a flash drive to work, by the way, but you will need some kind of flash drive for the operating system as it, the drive, as the hard drive should only be really used for data. Like that's kind of a given. A drive like this will sit you back about 10 bucks off Amazon. There are a few other miscellaneous items that I put into this build. None of them are necessary at all, but they do all help in their own small way. One was a Bit Phoenix Spectre Pro 230 millimeter fan. This I set in the front and it's the intake fan that draws in air and blows cool air over all of the drives. One of these will set you back about $24. The other miscellaneous thing that I bought are these SATA power extensions. I bought these so I could keep the power cables on the back of the drives really, cre really clean and really easy to manage. And they're all spaced exactly for the spacing in between the drives. So I picked up three technically, but I'm only using two. There's, there's a five drive uh, power connector on the top. I'm using the top three, and that is connected to one SATA 
uh, power string, power cable. And then I have another one that's three drives only connecting the bottom two. I'm running each on separate power cables so I don't accidentally overload one. I picked both these up on Taobao, so these are China made. So giving you a price comparison, a price for them is not exactly applicable, but I think once I convert it over, it's like they're like three dollars a piece. Completely unnecessary, but they make cable management really, really easy. The build is really straightforward. I pulled out the five and a quarter drive bay as I wasn't going to use it, and as I had the case open, I flipped the actual drive bays around so that the all the cables were on the left side of the case. This allowed me to seat the GPU without having to pull the drives out. And the GPU, while we're talking about it, wouldn't even be necessary, like I said, if I had bought an APU, like the A8 7600, or even yes, like going the Intel route and getting an Intel G4400, the Pentium. But getting a new GPU would add to the cost of this build, and I was trying to avoid that. So to make this into the version 2 that I was talking about, uh, I dropped in a few other parts after I had the system up and running for maybe about two weeks. The biggest change that I made is I upgraded the CPU cooler from the stock one to a CryoRig H7. The temps are slightly lower now with the H7 in, maybe about 5 to 7 C uh, when it's at load, when the system is at load, which is during transfers but really it's the reduction in noise that's super key here. This, the H7 doesn't really sound any different under load compared to it being an idle, but the stock cooler, when that thing was under load, man, it sounded like a jet engine when files were getting transferred. And I know that AMD stock coolers are notoriously loud, but I could honestly hear this from like 20 feet away and it was in a separate room. It was that loud, so I'm, totally happy that I put up the extra bucks and got the H7. I also added a deep cool PWM fan hub and three more fans, two of which are stock NZXT 120mm uh, fans and one is a Cooler Master 140mm jet flow. The temps weren't really all that high, but you know, I had extra fans lying around that weren't doing anything, so I was like, I might as well put them to good use as the case feels a little warm once everything was running and it was, you know, it had been in the storage room for days. And the last change wasn't actually an addition, it was, sub it was a subtraction. See, if you take a look at the Phenom on the front panel on the sides, you have this really cool mesh. Unfortunately, if you pull that mesh out, you have only these tiny holes that are your front air intakes. Like this, this is it. And this is not, like this isn't cool. Like you can't pull any air in through this. So I took off the mesh and I basically cut out the majority of the plastic, like as much as I could without sacrificing being able to mount the mesh back in. And I know this is like ugly AF, like this is awful looking, but it's mostly due to a lack of tools, and when you put the mesh back on, it completely hides the grossness. So with that, you know, once I've got everything in the case now, I've got everything up and everything connected, system boots, so I'm gonna bring this video to a close. In the next video, I'm gonna talk about what software I can run, I'm gonna set up the software, show you guys how to go do all of that, and then my final thoughts on everything here, doing this whole build. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up in the corner. And if you really want to see me do more builds like this, click on the subscribe button so I can keep bringing videos like, like this one to you every Sunday. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.